Okay, we're gonna get started. We're gonna roll, all right? Um, uh, good morning, I'm Rod Ferguson. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this panel to celebrate this ev the event-worthy publication of Avery Gordon's The Hawthorne Archive, Letters from the Utopian Margins, uh, the concept book that is its own archive of items and entries that provide models and idioms for being quote unquote, unavailable for ser servitude. Uh, she is professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and visiting professor at Birkbeck School of Law, University of London. In addition to the Hawthorne archive, she's the author of The Workhouse, The Brightenau, Brightenau Room, with Inez Schaber, and the classic Ghostly Matters, Haunting in the Sociological Imagination. As an academic and public citizen, she serves on the editorial committee of the journal Race and Class and is the co-host of No Alibis, a weekly public affairs radio program on KCSB FM Santa Barbara. First, we will hear from our from Avery herself, who will give us a reading, and then we will hear from um, Ann Svekovich from UT Austin. Lisa, Lisa's been here Lisa. Okay, from <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Lowe, uh, from Tufts University, from and Spekovich at UT Austin, and then from Ruthie Gilmore at the City University of New York. All right, thank you. <laughs> so we're, we're having a self-organized panel, as you can tell. Okay. Um, well, um, first of all, <laughs> let me say how really grateful I am um, to Roderick for organizing this panel and to thank really with all my heart Anne and Ruthie and Lisa for taking time out of their very busy schedules to read this quite large and unwieldy book. If you haven't seen it, it's heavy, it's big. That has been produced um, with Richard Morrison's support at Fordham University Press. Richard is in the back, thank you. Um, and I thank everyone also for coming this morning. And there's some chairs in the front if you want to sit down. Um, so I'm really just very um, grateful, humbled by the attention that these extraordinary scholars and my friends have given the work. And I wasn't sure exactly how we would go um, this morning. So what I would like to do is just say a very brief word, not very much overall, because I think basically what everyone else is gonna do is gonna do that more and better than me. Um, but, and then read you something from it because one of the things that people always ask me is, well, what is the Hawthorne Archive? And this will give you some more idea of what it was and then whatever it happens next is gonna happen next. So my intellectual work has involved for quite some time now trying to um, find or look for a vocabulary for the subjugated knowledge of slaves, prisoners, runaways, war deserters, and um, other troublemakers, many of whom have left few written records, or if they are alive or difficult to meet with face to face and talk to. I was and still am very much trying to develop a writing practice, an evocative language in which form could hold this content um, respectfully could treat it as a generalizable knowledge, a theoretical knowledge, not as a local specific knowledge to be governed by a putative superior person or, or theory. This knowledge is necessarily fragmentary and requires a certain degree of invention to put into writing, requires some kind of methodology or practice or form that can carry the traces of the history that dismissed the knowledge in the first place forward towards something else, something in excess of the mode of production through which it appears to us precisely as marginalized or fugitive. This writing practice, at least as I've been developing it or methodology is neither fiction nor traditional scholarly writing as we know it, but it's based in both both of those things. Um, the rather distinctive form of the book, which I think you'll hear more about, um, I think Lisa's gonna describe that especially, um, is in part, <laughs> yes? Okay, everyone's gonna describe that. So right now it'll just seem abstract, but um, it has the form, takes the form of an archive itself 
Anne can hold the pictures up if she wants, um, that this is in part the result of, um, of t making this search, of doing this work while working with artists, now very much so for the past 15 years, and in particular the sophistication of research-based art practices, the horizontalization of conceptual work, self-organized publications, active politicization of many artists have created spaces for productive conversations that, um, and collaborations with others such as myself, and I have found this environment um, freeing a little bit to, um, to think and to um, engage in more experimental, pedagogical, and also writing formats, although to be honest, I'm not really sure that this book really quite finds the right form, although it does, I think, register something of the fragmentary and disorganized nature of the utopian margins, um, occupied as they are, as Rod so nicely put it in his um, panel proposal, I'm gonna quote him now, um, uh, occupy the utopian margins, occupied by the slaves that ran, the abolitionists who clung to the mantra, oh nothing, oh nothing, oh nothing, and the soldiers who deserted wars and their rationales. So this was then the context in which I was persuaded to take over the job um, as the keeper or the organizer of the Hawthorne Archives. The Hawthorne Archives are not named after Nathaniel um, Hawthorne, they are named after the Hawthorne tree. Um, so I can say more about the tree if you're interested <laughs> later, but it's named after the tree, not the man. Um, the archive houses an incomplete and rather disorganized intellectual history of a somewhat but not entirely random selection of radicals, fugitives, runaways, deserters, abolitionists, heretics, dreamers, and indifference, who at some point stopped doing what they were told to do, stopped thinking what they were told they had to think, and stop being available for things they had no design in making or controlling, including various forms of enslavement, indenture, and impressment. The preface to the book gives more background and so on, so if you're interested, you can read more about it there. But what I hope, at least, is that all these documents um, and materials collected in the book will show, or at least suggest, is that what's there in those utopian margins is a, quote, collective intelligence gathered from struggle, which was the way that Cedric Robinson described the black radical tradition, a subjugated knowledge that sometimes speaks its own language, but almost always exceeds the contingent socioeconomic conditions and geopolitical locations in which it arises, a poetic knowledge born, to quote Aimé Césaire, in the great silence of scientific knowledge. So, um, the book is divided into four sections, which I won't describe, um, but I'm going to read you um, something from the first section, which is called The Scandal of the Qualitative Difference, and it begins with this letter. Um, Midwinter, dear C, I hope you return safely from your travels. I'm still planning on visiting you shortly, and I'm looking forward to it. In the meantime, I'm writing you about the large archive project in which some of us are involved. I received the message that you've agreed to help. Thanks very much, we need it. What we would like for you to do is to figure out how to create some kind of record or documentation of the city of B so that it will not be completely lost to us while nonetheless keeping the city relatively hidden or at least keeping us relatively hidden from it. And it is in fact the somewhat complicated requirements around visibility that explain why we felt not identifying you or the city by name was best for now, although we're mindful that these requirements could change in the future. At this point, the documentation can be, probably should be minimal, ephemeral even. I'm not even sure that documentation is the right word, frankly. Also, I should say there's been some disagreement on this end over whether the documentation itself should be kept hidden. I'll try to give you some background. The most famous description of the city was written years ago by an Italian writer and his youth a military objector, communist, and agronomy student who became a fabulous ethnographer of the hidden parts of stories and the memories of things he loved. You may recall it, and I quote now from the description of the city. I should not tell you of B, the unjust city. Instead, I should tell you of the hidden B, 
the city of the just, handling makeshift materials in the shadowy rooms behind the shops and beneath the stairs, linking a network of wires and pipes and pulleys and pistons and counterweights that infiltrates like a climbing plant among the great cogged wheels. Instead of describing to you the perfume pools of the baths where the unjust recline and weave their intrigues, I should say to you how the just, always cautious to avoid the spying syncophants and mass arrests, recognize one another by their way of speaking, from their habits, and from their som som somber but tasty cuisine. In the seed of the city of the just, a malignant seed is hidden in its turn. The certainty and pride of being in the right and of being more just than the many others who call themselves more just than the just. <laughs> this seed ferments in bitterness, rivalry, resentment, and the natural desire of revenge on the unjust is colored by a yearning to be in their place and to act as they do. Another unjust city, though different from the first, is digging out its space within the double sheaf of the unjust and just cities. I must also draw your attention to an intrinsic quality of this unjust city germinating secretly inside the secret just city. And this is the possible awakening of a later love for justice, not yet subjected to rules, capable of reassembling still more just, a city still more just than it was before it became the vessel of injustice. From my words, you will have reached the conclusion that B is a temporal secession of different cities alternately just and unjust. But what I really wanted to warn you about is something else. All the future bees are already present in this instant, wrapped one within the other, confined, crammed, inextricable. The spect this is now the, the letter, letter writer returns. The specter of an always already contaminated justice, shadowed and bound by the very thing it is committed to correct and eliminate, this is B's powerful conceit or curse or essential truth, depending on your point of view. I still remember very well when many influential so-called radical thinkers believed that the idea of the impossibility of justice was a critical notion. The making of impossibility rather than justice, the measure of critical adequacy, would have merely seemed a surreal episode in the history of intelligent academic ideas gone off course except that this way of thinking really took hold among political philosophers, theorists, artists, curators, and assorted intellectual and cultural types, and got a kind of second wind as political authority became more transparently corrupt and repressive, and frustration, anger, despair, and fear became more widespread. At the time, some felt that the whole idea was just a dressed up way of justifying political, absenteeis political absenteeism and self-advancement a rather self-serving definition of sophistication. A harsh judgment, perhaps too harsh, but when faced with the often arrogant expressions of the idea, it certainly felt that way, since it was almost always articulated by those living in a world of relative privilege, which was defended energetically when threatened. In any event, the people who held fast to this idea became more and more separated from those of us who meanwhile carried on, as Raymond Williams used to say. Carried on regardless of the fact that justice is a living idea that is stitched and unraveled and then is stretched again between moving points. We proceeded as best we could along the breaks in the concept, revising, mending, correcting, and then amending the revisions, letting go and picking up the stitches, while always being guided by the basic value of fairness that the term justice acquired late in its life. With practice, we began to develop a better vocabulary for justice, but we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't heeded the Italian writer's final warning about the historical laws that govern B and that keep its futures enclosed in a series of presents that can never break the inevitable restoration of the rule of the unjust. Perhaps, if I <coughs> perhaps I've told you that I began to consider running away myself when I saw this vision as an illusion one that made invisible the many spaces of autonomous <coughs> life existing within or between, wrapped, confined, crammed, the secession of just and unjust cities, spaces that I inhabited or certainly was aware of. And I finally left when I was persuaded that illusory or not, B was trapped in that dialectic and might remain so for the foreseeable future. I can tell you more about the larger scope of the archive when I see you, for now perhaps it's enough to know what motivates more or less our interest. 
If you decide to travel to the city, we'll help you in whatever way we can, but please be careful. Not sure how safe it is at present. If you have other needs or questions, please let us know. You know how to reach me. Love, A, on behalf of the Hawthorne Archive. Can I, can I keep going? Is there enough time for me to keep going? Okay. So then um, C writes back, sorry we didn't get to meet, thanks me for our letter, says that she'll um, take part, but wants some more um, information. There's, yeah, C writing back. Um, she's going to leave next month. Um, so, okay? Okay. So then I write her back because she wants more information about the Hawthorne Archive. Dear C, um, you send good news in accepting our assignment, and we are grateful. Do you want to look at the letter? Can I put that back if you like? Um, you send good news in accepting our assignment, and we are grateful that you can depart so soon. You ask for more information about the Hawthorne Archive. The Hawthorne Archive is very old, having begun long before I became involved in it. It's possible that it's as old as the 12th century. It seems to emerge and recede in the tracks of the various Euro-American social struggles against slavery, racial capitalism, imperialism, and authoritarian forms of order. There's a timeline I can show you if you come to the office. Because it has assumed different forms over time, sometimes more rooted in place, sometimes more itinerant, because there has often been a premium on secrecy, given the fugitive nature of its activities and the people involved in it, because it has always been most concerned to find, promote, and keep safe the subjugated knowledge of what Subcomandante Marcos called the nobodies, um, anonymous, ordinary people who leave few written records of their own, and because the people most responsible for the archive seem never to prioritize proper record keeping, the actual information about the archive itself is sparse and unreliable. This is, in fact, one impetus for asking you to make a report on B. I think I've told you that I became involved in the archive because I had been collecting written and visual documents, first-hand stories, literature, scholarly research on utopian societies and plans for them, on imaginary places, and on the various theories that justified or underwrote what, broadly speaking, went by the name utopian. I started this work during the Fourth World War against humanity, when the situation, a strange modernity, as Marcos observed at the time, looked very bleak. The worldwide concentration of great wealth and financial power produced a corollary um, expansion of dire poverty and surplus populations of people treated as social waste, such as the landless, the homeless, and the imprisoned. Extraction and exploitation continued, laying waste to parts of the world that previously had been spared and seriously damaging the world's ecology. The contraction of democratic controls everywhere and of the short-lived welfare state where it existed was delivered with the massive expansion of police power. Counterinsurgency became the norm, as did the doctrine of permanent war and relentless destructive expansionist ground wars were waged by the North, starting first against Western and Southern Asia and then moving into large swaths of Africa, where people hadn't recovered yet from the first world war against humanity. There was consequently a growing stratification of people both within and between nations and a general feeling of the breakdown of community accompanied both by an increase in people on the move and by an ideological onslaught against anything common, public, not bought and sold, not useful to the powers that be. This was a scene of barbarism without doubt, but it seemed as if the resistance and opposition to the war, pockets to be sure, were invisible acknowledged grudgingly by critical intellectuals but trivialized to the point of disqualification. There were legitimate reasons to assess some of this resistance complacent and inadequate to the powers arrayed against it, but these reasons were often put into the service of dismissal rather than constructive engagement. One difficulty here was that some of what was called resistance wasn't merely individual or collective acts of opposition and disapproval. They were, in fact, other ways of living. These other ways of living were variously incohate, incipient, emergent, and in some cases mature. Efforts to describe these unruly desires and unmanaged life worlds faltered, faltered for lacking a language for describing and historicizing them, faltered too often on the accusation of utopianism, a terrible, almost criminal error for many radicals. I was disturbed by this situation and spent a couple of years researching the history of the utopian and the history of the accusation and came to many conclusions, some of which I describe in the reports that I attach, which I thankfully will not read you now. 
Um, including <laughs> that a fundamental problem was that in the entire history of the utopian as we knew that term, the most important and wide-reaching radical movements and bodies of radical thought and practice were simply absent. The archive had long been dealing with the intellectual aspect of the problem, trying to put the missing pieces back into play and to discover or invent the languages required, and so it was relatively prepared for what the Fourth World War against humanity produced a wave of pe people becoming indifference, running away, no longer living as obedient subjects to the world capitalist system. This wave also produced several related archive institutes and academies, some in solidarity with the Hawthorne archives, such as the September Institute, some opposed or merely competitive. It was to one of these related projects that the keeper at the time went with our good wishes and an appreciation for the wonderful bread, <laughs> there's a reference to the bread here, um, <laughs> that we would get from them on their baking days, you know it. Mm -hmm. I was the likely candidate to take her place, but I was coming and going a lot, um, and my decision to stay for good had repercussions I hadn't anticipated, and it took me a long time to settle in to make new friends and to reactivate the archive in the new conditions, which brings me to the request for the report on B. For reasons that I mentioned, the archive has always been ambivalent about and incompetent at recording its own history. Now the people from B feel it is important that we document it and that we create memories of the place from which we ran away and to which we became indifferent. Understandably, at first we needed a total break. Now we are growing more and more distant from B, and some believe this makes it increasingly difficult for us to know whether it is as distant from us as we are from it. They think this is a destabilizing situation, in part with the Italian writer warned against. Others are concerned, not yet alarmed, over what it means that members of the archive are worrying over a warning they were meant to have escaped. Maybe B is closer than we think, they are murmuring. Yet others, on occasion me, roll their eyes and shout in a friendly voice at whoever will listen, don't complicate things. Notwithstanding these internal debates, we are in agreement that being connected to us, but also an outsider, you will be able to bring some needed perspective to the project. I thank you again for agreeing to participate and wish you Godspeed and safe travels. When you're finished and ready to send things, be back in touch. Love A, on behalf of the Hawthorne Archive. And then she did do a report, and there it is. That is C's report on B. Thank you. Well, I'm very um, honored by this pleasure and formidable task of discussing Avery Gordon's work and this remarkable new book. Um, all of Avery's work is the result of deep commitment originality, courage, and creative intelligence that has thoroughly innovated existing discussions. As you know, her first remarkable book, Ghostly Matters, Haunting in the Sociological Imagination, published 20 years ago in 1997, or first published then, demonstrated that modern knowledge practices are not only embedded in social forms of domination, but that such practices work to conceal rather than to disclose the relationship between knowledge and power. In Ghostly Matters, Avery argued that the empirical emphasis on visible, visible, excuse me, visible objects and evidence is established by means of the absenting or destruction of its conditions of possibility. Knowledge practices not only bury what James Baldwin called the evidence of things unseen, but the structures of making known themselves obfuscate and obliterate and render further unavailable other relations, modes, and practices. Avery referred to the trace of this destruction as the ghost and named the resurfacing of suppressed material conditions as haunting. Ghostly Matters works out the details of haunting in the discussion of three discrete examples, the origin of psychoanalysis, the phenomenon of the politically disappeared in Argentina, and the legacy of African-American slavery. Over the years, I've taught Ghostly Matters in more than a dozen graduate seminars and undergraduate courses, and it always blows students' minds. <laughs> it always imparts genuinely new ways of thinking that inform their own research and projects and activism. 
It's a work that has deeply influ influenced so much subsequent study in women's studies, gender studies, queer studies, black studies, ethnic studies, Asian studies, critical social theory, and more. It's virtually impossible to think of any works published in Scosely Matters in the last 20 years, including my own, that has not been shaped directly or indirectly by Avery Gordon's critique of sociological knowledge. Since Ghostly Matters, her work has moved in several different directions, art and cultural criticism, social theory, varieties of public discourse, yet it's possible to identify in all the various projects a sure, clear address of the violence of injustice, imprisonment, war, racism within the expansion of racial capitalism and empire, and her excavation as well of revolutionary social transformations in the past and possibly in the future. Her book of essays, Keeping Good Time, Reflections on Knowledge, Power, and People, reflects upon knowledge production, temporality, and social movements. The Workhouse Breitenau Room, which Rod mentioned, co-authored with Inez Schaber, Chopper, addresses these issues in an expressive, associative, philosophical manner. The volume evokes the history of Breitenau, a space that began as an early prison, evolved in the 19th century into a workhouse to re-educate the poor and vagrant, and became a reformatory for wayward girls and a sanitarium for the mentally ill, ultimately was a concentration camp during Nazi Germany. Employing photographs and text, the workhouse is a profound meditation on the aesthetics and politics of confinement, bondage, enclosure, and unfreedom, in which the Breitenau Room is framed as an archive, as a repository of both serial violent subjugation and the fugitive knowledge of escape, alternative sociality, and revolutionary transformations that may be yet to come. The text connects Breitenau with other carceral spaces, ones that sought to contain U.S. black political prisoners, such as George Jackson at San Quentin, or the prisoners rebelling at Attica in 1971, and it elaborates echoes between prisoner uprisings across time and space in Europe and the Americas and beyond. In a very different way, Avery's also continued to work on these problems within a social science discourse. As much as she's a severe critic of it, she also speaks within it for important reasons. And in a series of essays, she powerfully analyzes state power, military force, and practices of accumulation and dispossession that extend conditions of social death for some and protect the social life for others. For example, in one, the United States military prison, the normalcy of exceptional brutality, she examined the use of detainee torture, sexual abuse, and degradation in military prisons. In contrast to the aesthetic and philosophical attention uh, elaborated in the work of the Breitenau Room, for example, this essay is directly expository. Um, it documents abuse and torture. It names names. It talks about military prisons in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay, references data, states clear connections between the treatment of these U.S.-held military prisoners and the lynching of black Americans. It links the military prison at Alcatraz, the French Foreign Legion's occupation of the Congo, Madagascar, and the Ivory Coast. You noticed, I'm sure, we're in a room called the Gold Coast. Talk about the remnants of slavery. <coughs> the British Army's occupation of Northern Ireland, CIA black sites, and others. And she observes that the brutal, punitive, extra-legal imprisonment has always been a means of social control to dehumanize and also to suppress dissent and rebellion. And through a brief history of the modern military prison system, she argues that the U.S. military prisons and civilian prisons are deeply connected in terms of personnel, a punishment regi regime, law, geopolitics, and more. In other words, captivity and torture since transatlantic slavery itself have been deployed to produce civilly disabled subjects as enslaved, laboring, and dispossessed as the socially dead and the living dead of surplus populations. But we're here today to talk about her remarkable book, The Hawthorne Archive, Letters from the Utopian Margins. And I, I mentioned her previous work because this remarkable work is very much a, a culmination and an explosion <laughs> of this earlier work and her continuing concerns. It treats the history and the present of utopian imagination and the possibilities for social transformation. It brings a powerful challenge to what we think we know about history, struggles for human emancipation, and the relationship between ideas, imagination, and social change. 
it's very much in my reading. Of course, everybody's going to have their own reading, so I don't mean in any way to monopolize your meaning. Um, but to me, it seems very much about the possibility, the simultaneous possibility and impossibility for knowledge, understanding, and social justice. And her continuing concern with the forced invisibility of alternative ways of living, knowing, being, loving, and communing, and revolutionizing. Um, the Hawthorne Archive, as you can see from her readings, is an experiment in genre that combines political thinking, history, geography, social theory, aesthetics in a fragmented way um, and, uh, and to conceive and present a new methodology for excavating utopian social experiments. It brings together fact, fiction, theory, and image to grapple with and better understand the ways that people must live with and against domination, subjugation, and violence, and which, quote, despite their overwhelming power, never quite overtake or become them. In Framing Utopian Thought and Practice, the Hawthorne Archive doesn't focus on your more common, customary, well-known utopian traditions of Marx or William Morris, but rather links the other utopianism, as she said, of radicals, runaways, deserters, abolitionists, heretics, dreamers, and liberationists, unquote, who are separated by time and place, but come together in this archive. It comprises the rich, suppressed, lesser known traditions of imagining social justice and human survival in the utopian margins of what are more celebrated emancipation movements, feminist movements, human rights movements, and so forth. In what Avery calls utopian surplus, we glimpse what may have been <coughs> meant by and hoped for in struggles for human freedom and emancipation, and we understand that utopia is not mere fantasy or projection, but a concrete mode of living and surviving. As in Ghostly Matters, this revelation of utopian meaning is crucially a matter of learning to read, interpret, see, and understand the evidence of things not seen. In a way, the Hawthorne Archive is a tutorial or a pr apprenticeship in how to read utopia. The premise of the Hawthorne Archive is that A is the keeper of the archive. A has edited and cleared for release the items in the archive, which include a series of letters between A and C, some of which Avery read, which frame the materials and the fragments collected. As readers, we're situated in a hypothetical time in which the Fourth World War against humanity has occurred, and A has collected materials that are significant to understanding how people survived under and organized against those conditions, collecting what seems to emerge and recede in the tracks of the various Euro-American social struggles, as she said, against slavery, racial capitalism, imperialism, and authoritarian forms of order. There's an allegory here, an allegory of a time after accumulation, after extraction, camps, prisons, permanent war, and environmental destruction, and it serves as a cautionary tale referring to the deadly, unsustainable practices of our present social order. Everything in the Hawthorne arch Archive, in my reading, operates in a future, future conditional temporality, the time in which a future guaranteed by modern progress has reached its ultimate limit when war, poverty, depletion, degradation, torture, and violation have dealt their worst. And yet, the Hawthorne Archive enacts a metalepsis, a temporal displacement through which we are resituated in time. The impending catastrophe of world war has already happened, and inexplicably, inexplicably we have escaped and we're alive to read these fragments and traces of our present. The history, the, the reader is rescued from that deadliest point of what could have been and has survived to read and interpret what we are doing now and that might determine what still could be. It's a reminder that the present course that is wholly capable of bringing the world to complete end has not done so and we are not there yet. It suggests that the future of our present is yet ahead, a time in which change is still possible. This future conditional opens a space of a different kind of thinking or speculation, um, a place of multiple attentions that encompass both the timeline of modernity with its aggressive inevitability of capitalism and war and the simultaneous condition that there may be alternatives, emergent, barely legible, rising, inchoate alternatives through which we might avert, divert, and transform that timeline. 
This multiple temporality posits a new hermeneutic framework and provides an occasion to discern what the promises and perils of modernity both reveal and conceal. All at once, it recalls the past, inhabits the present, and raises the question of the future. From out of which resources might we conceptualize and secure a future if our present world hurdles towards the making of that future, imp it future's impossibility? The idea that we could have survived to be reading these fragments cast the archives as slightly prophetic. It is both a genealogy of connected forms of unfreedom, slavery, colonialism, captivity, imprisonment, deprivation, civil and social death, yet it simultaneously moves the reader to decipher how scaffoldings, ghosts, and fragments of alternatives might, must have and might have existed. As the Hawthorne Archive collects the entangled histories of present possibility in many locations, it suggests that we miss these possibilities if we recognize only the more traditional versions of heroic revolution or if we celebrate only the mon on monumental and ignore the marginal, the everyday, the underground, the casual, the quiet persistence of organizing care, collaboration, and collectivity. As Avery said, there are four sections. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. <laughs> I have one more page. So there are four sections. Um, and I kind of think of the four sections. Oh, okay. Yeah, so one more minute or so. Um, um, there are four sections, and I kind of think of the four sections as uh, these uh, collections of reasons why we don't see what's happening in our now. So the first one's called The Scandal of Qualitative Difference, and it prevents it presents uh, informal archaeology of the concept of the utopian. So it, it moves through uh, more traditional, you know, Thomas More, Fourier, Saint-Simon, uh, Marx, and so forth, yet considered from this allegorical post-war, fourth war against humanity perspective. It also includes a series of letters between Avery and Céline about friendship as a radical utopian modality of social change. Section two is called A Means of Preparation, and it's a collection that revalues the radical subjugated knowledges of different abolitionist imaginaries of dissenters, renegades, deserters, maroons, in, uh, insurgents, presenting the ways in which multiple intelligences and means were and are collectively mobilized to abolish enslavement, enclosure, and subjection, such as fugitivity or running away. In a world map, in notes, in emails, we read the patterns of the catastrophes of colonization, extractivism, security states, war economies, as well as the mobilized resistance and utopian planning of the outlawed poor, and utopian planning, I'm thinking of uh, Moton and, and um, Harney, uh, um, of the outlawed poor, abandoned and dispossessed, communalist and communists, maroons, fugitive slaves, and escapees, what uh, Moton and Hardy would call the undercommons and what Robin D.G. Kelly describes as freedom dreams that are inaudible and illegible within prevailing formulas of political rationality. Section three is called the exile of our longing, um, which I think refers in many ways to the necessity to dare to desire something different. I mean, so often we're, I don't want to digress. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you know, we, we, we really are always just hoping for crumbs. <laughs> but what if we didn't? <laughs> um, we want more. <laughs> so in the exile of our longing, um, the archive collects and revisits images, affects, and animisms of haunting and traces the afterlives of state-sponsored yet disavowed racial violence in Gaza, the West Bank, and Palestinian refugee camps in the archive of films about French colonial modernity in Africa and its emancipation projects in the prison of Martin Luther King's 1963 letter from the Birmingham jail, in Roland Barthes' photographs, in the story of an an anarchist steelworker's attempt to assassinate pre President McKinley and then his death by electric chair. Finally, section four called Perception of the Subjectivity of the So-Called Object presents items that elaborate the notion of utopian surplus by excavating particularly 
the ways that consignment has been both a crucial technology of domination and a site for powerful alternative imaginaries. <clears throat> like the materials on Breitenau, this section excavates different prisons as archives, collecting photos, thoughts, documents, and fragments about confinement, bondage, and enclosure, which attest to both the terror of suffering and dehumanization and the ghosts, the sounds, the surplus that offer flashes of possibility, of escape, of alternative sociality, and of other worlds yet to come. The Hawthorne Archive suggests the need to be able to read and recognize the ongoing resilience of radical thought and evolutionary practice that exists in our contemporary moment. It suggests that embracing what is radically utopian might mean learning to see our now very differently, giving up familiar premises of political liberation so that we might understand the radical possibilities that of what resides unseen and undisclosed, daring to hope and desire, willing ourselves to be, to commune, and to think differently. It is not an exaggeration to say that there really is no other work with which one might honestly compare the Hawthorne archives. The scope, originality, the daring, and the ambition is remarkable and original and, and different. <laughs> it is also true that we really, really need this book. We need its hope, its courage, its certainty that not only will we survive these dire, lethal, authoritarian times, but that we are already surviving them, and that crucial to that survival is to recognize and embrace this radically utopian now. Thank you. <laughs> Did I all? That was great. <laughs> that was a much more dutiful summary <laughs> than I'm going <laughs> to try to manage. So that was perfect that Lisa went first. Oh, no, I, I didn't feel obliged to, but I'm glad that someone did. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's for me also a daunting task. Um, it's partly because I respect Avery's work so much, also because I love it so much, but I think I'm not alone in that. Um, it has been and remains and will be uh, very precious to me as a um, tool for survival. So really what I can offer is a kind of testimony to uh, what's meaningful to me. Any one of you I'm sure could do the same if we had more time. Um, and I had to just kind of think about this as a conversation, like I'm just talking to Avery about <laughs> some ideas and with some other folks. Um, so I like the fact that the witches show up right away and <laughs> in connection with the tree that gives Avery's book its name. We are told that the Hawthorne is favored by witches and other internationalists who celebrate the first of May. Um, perhaps it's because they are familiar with the ancient lore that surrounds the Hawthorne's ability to, quote, so I'm giving you a little bit more about the Hawthorne, um, protect the border to the world of the dead and heal a broken heart, unquote. In Avery's world, witches and Marxists, makers of magic and sensuous knowledge, cavort together, part of a strange company forged in refusal, a solidarity or fellowship that yields no orthodox or monolithic proletariat, but instead an open-ended list of types. You've heard this list already, and that repetition, I think, and recitation, recitation, is a really important part of uh, what Avery's doing and what we will do in her wake. So radicals, runaways, deserters, abolitionists, heretics, dreamers, and liberationists. Um, such lists occur with some frequency across the Hawthorne archive. What unites these bands of fellow travelers is that they, and here um, I, Avery's already said this, but I, I want to say it again, it's important. At some point, they stopped doing what they were told they had to do, stopped thinking what they were told they had to think, and stopped being available for things they had no design in making or controlling, unquote. That's kind of it. Like, that is the argument of this book in a nutshell. Um, it provides you, it's, it makes lists, it provides records, it provides accounts, and here I uh, emphasis on count, like a counting up of these different people. It's a roll call. It's like, are you in the room? Are we together? Can we be together in this room? Um, and uh, these, these people are defined 
again, not in conventional identity categories, but also um, defined by these names we could give them, but also by an attitude or a way of living, a, a, a kind of affective condition that is um, being defined equally by what or who they refuse, but also what or who they embrace or side with. Uh, so in this joining of refusal and embrace, Gordon, I'm calling you Gordon here, um, it cuts through, <laughs> um, this is Avery as kind of, you know, theorist, uh, through, um, so Gordon cuts through what have often been very high-flying and heated debates about critique and the reparative, about dialectics of hope and despair or terror and joy, about Afro-pessimisms and queer utopias. She cuts through them to give us just that one sentence. Um, and she does so by noticing uh, something that is really quite simple, but apparently very hard to see or attend to. It requires a certain kind of person, a keeper of an archive perhaps, to notice these acts of refusal. Sometimes they aren't even acts of refusal, they were just preparations for a kind of refusal. And yet nonetheless they count as a something to be seen and as something to be recorded and as something to be placed in the Hawthorne archive. Um, they are also practices, this is a really key phrase, um, Rod started with it. Uh, it comes from Avery's beautiful uh, reading um, and contextualizing of um, Tony K. Bambara's work, um, being unavailable for servitude. So that would be another way of saying it. And sometimes it's just a matter of finding another way of saying a thing that's quite simple and yet which we forget we need to be reminded of, we need to have tools and vocabulary to remember these things. Um, so practices of being unavailable for su servitude and the kinds of people who engage in those practices. So they're under the care of a keeper, someone who's attuned to what's on the margins, who pays attention to fragmented and piecemeal records and who will protect them in order to provide a cumulat cumulative record of utopian possibility. The result of this work or this theory or this premise is no ordinary book. Um, and I'm especially intrigued uh, by how in order to be um, an archive of this kind, it also has to become an artist book and importantly, both together. There's a kind of witchcraft in the making of this very, very heavy book, um, but it's a, it's a thing you made, like it's a making um, and hence the visuals and the layout and the care. I do have to just pass my copy around because I'm sure not everyone There's many copies at the Florida <laughs> booth um, or order forms. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hefty. The layout's important. The images are important. The weight of it is important. And then also the, the writing. So I hope already in what I've been conjuring or reconjuring, you hear um, the importance of the phrase and also the importance of association or connection or the concatenation of different phrases together. So just my take, uh, uh, maybe we'll all have one on the four sections that Avery's mentioned, Lisa's uh, mentioned as well. I think it's really important, although it's hard. It's one of the things that is difficult about this book, but also um, I think will benefit from um, workshops, seminars, classrooms, like ways of, of having it become and mean something in a practice of reading it. So the, the sections are taken from other people. They're a recitation of uh, Marcuse, Cedric Robinson, uh, Patricia Williams, and Anselm Franck. And uh, again, it's interesting to see what the sources are. It's, a, it's an unusual lineage, um, and it's a patching together. Um, you know, it is sort of a, one of those Hollywood things, like, what happens when you put this together with this? <laughs> so, and for me, it's like, what happens when you put Marx and Toni Morrison together, um, would be one, one way to say that. Um, so we have these phrases, the scandal of the qualitative difference, a means of preparation. Um, qual that the first one is Marcuse, means of preparation is Cedric Robinson, the exile of our longing is Patricia Williams, the perception of the subjectivity of the so-called object is Anselm Frank. I actually have my own colloquial understanding <laughs> of what the four sections are because I always have to break it down and make it simple. So I think the first section is, well, it's, it's labeled as such, is utopia. The sec second section is called running away. It could have been called slavery, but it's not. It's called running away. The third section is um, haunting. Um, and the fourth section 
um, is, is called, as Lisa said, the utopian surplus, but it could have been called prisons or incarceration. And that dialogue around what is the, what is the relation between slavery then, prisons now, and also what is the relation between um, uh, haunting and utopia, i.e., some way to what is the relation between these two books that Avery wrote, one of which is um, uh, thankfully um, very frequently read, the other of which is scandalously <laughs> underread, um, keeping good time, and that uh, I'm sure people disseminate it in their own under commonsy kind of way, um, but I was glad to see some of it resituated in, in this context. Um, so I, um, I've been learning from Avery for a long time, uh, fortunately often in kind of side-by-side -side conversation. And um, I'm reminded of the fact that at some point when I was, I mean, I've been trying to learn this lesson for a long time of what it would mean to put these things together. So uh, at some point when I was writing an archive of feelings, Avery read a draft of the introduction and said, this is a book about joy, not trauma. <laughs> 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 and um, at, the <laughs> at the time, at the time, I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> I failed. <laughs> I, I took it as a, you know, in that way, uh, I mean, if you've been, you know, Avery's critiques are, like, very bracing, uh, partly because they are so straightforward. Um, but I thought it was like, oh, I failed to be serious enough. Like, uh, the book's, like, totally lightweight. It's about joy, happiness, survival. <laughs> um, but I did, I did come to realize that, um, particularly, again, as these oscillations between pessimisms, optimisms, critique, the reparative um, debates about what I think of as these kind of affective pairs or dialectical evil twins or something, um, uh, go on, I, I think already Avery was teaching me that these things are not separate, so why fight about it? <laughs> you know, the sort of the either or to the death. Um, <coughs> And so, uh, so that inextricable linking, the linki linking of haunting and utopia across uh, the Hawthorne archive, I think of as a major contribution to a set of debates that um, are, are ongoing. In some ways, it's for me, it's the, the affective turn tracked back to Marxism's efforts to think the political. And so I, I kind of appreciate that we're living in the, in the register of the affective with respect to what is the way forward, but it also can sometimes be quite um, sectarian again, and we've just been talking about that recently, Avery and I. Um, so uh, just a couple of lessons. Uh, this will be for me as a teacher, I think, in the classroom, and that might be one of our zones of conversation, is um, how I think I will use this book to teach and, and to add to the work of Avery's that uh, like Lisa, I teach very consistently. It always blows my students away. It's kind of like the little secret, again, secret network of the Avery lovers and users. Um, and uh, so uh, one thing always important for me is, for example, um, what is the difference between haunting as a critical category and trauma as a critical category? Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm happy to see more material to work with in order to continue to think about that since the keyword trauma continues to circulate in ways that I sometimes find um, not so helpful. Um, and uh, so one of, one of the recaps we get is that phrase that, again, a lot of my students tend to quote is, is, um, is, is uh, haunting as um, an emergent state that indicates a something that must be done. That something that must be done um, is, a, is something that gets reworked and repeated and um, in very interesting ways ac across this new material. Um, I just... Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it does. <laughs> there's there's a, a couple of different essays. There's one in particular that's, a, again, I think a kind of gentle rebuke to Tom Keenan um, out of a dialogue on fables of responsibility. And I think it's also a bit of a, a gentle response to Marx um, and um, the, the specters, I mean, sorry, to Derrida on specters of Marx and to, in general, sort of post-structuralist or deconstructionist approaches to politics that have uses and then also limits. And so um, Avery talks about actually her, 
about an attachment to a harsh sectarian even politics that she managed to maneuver um, to or that ha which had no capacity for tenderness or sympathy and so I think that's also really important in terms of how she's aiming to put ideas together and conversations um, so uh, one of her teachings I think in um, response to uh, she says I tend to place greater emphasis on solidarity mutuality and competent action uh, rather than on ungroundedness and thinking about politics and responsibility. Responsibility in this context is a condition of abolition democracy. Uh, then she says uh, at another point in the same essay, everyone has to live in the gap between theory and practice, between the ideas we have and what we are able to make of them as an embodied life. Everybody lives and works in the gap. The question is what you're doing there. Um, that's it, again, and, and it is also why this book has to be a preparation or only a letter because it lives off the page, both in the work Avery does and in the work that she is um, soliciting us to do or encouraging us to do, or, you know, it, it is a kind of, you could take it as a, a rallying cry, but also a, like, go do it. Um, so, for example, this is very poignant for me uh, right now for graduate students and faculty how to gain or keep a place in the university however precarious and corporatized those places are now to contribute to the work of producing independent critical knowledge without being taken over by the academy's labor regimes and disciplinary structures simple and hard <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, that's a little bit of just one of the many ways I think that there'll be you know, entry points and exit points for um, all of us in our reading and teaching with the book. Um, I s also just want to cite, I've kind of said this already, but just underscore with respect to the question of utopia, um, as someone who has taught um, something more powerful than skepticism many, many, many times, um, and also as someone who um, is works in or is identified with uh, a particularly queer strand of affect theory wanting to keep Avery's work in there alongside of the long bibliography that includes Jose Munoz's work and um, Jack Halberstam's work, um, a variety of other folks. Um, and, uh, and so it's again about creating these juxtapositions of remembering that things come from many different um, places and have been there for a very long time. So this was also your sort of polite uh, reference in what you read to the absence of certain kinds of traditions of radical thought in certain more orthodox canons. Um, and so I just really appreciate that. Um, so just a bit more I wanted to say, do I have like another five or something? On um, uh, archives and writing practice, for, for me in particular because I've also been working at the crossroads of art archives and writing practice. Uh, one of the things that I'm really trying to think about in, um, in reading a Avery's book is the question of form. Uh, I'll just read a bit. This is actually from the reader's report I wrote, but it's kind of fun that now I get to <laughs> think about, um, yeah, what, like, what is she doing? Um, adding to the value of Hawthorne Archive is its unusual style and structure, which will be a major part of its appeal. Laid out in the form of an archive, um, it's a formal experiment, or as Avery says, an idiosyncratic methodology for a research-based writing practice. That is scholarship in which the writing practice is the theory. It adds to a growing body of performative and experimental scholarly writing. I think there are people like Kate, my colleague Katie Stewart or um, Sadia Hartman, also uh, out in the public sphere, the, the status of a complicated category of creative nonfiction practiced by people like Claudia Rankin or Maggie Nelson, people who share Gore, uh, Avery's on, uh, ongoing interest in rethinking history, the social science, and notions of data and evidence. Gordon's fusion of critical theory and creative writing includes the unusual way in which the argument is made through the imaginary infrastructure of an archive. It bears some resemblance to a collection of essays, but the framing of the pieces as archival fragments culled from a range of sources and occasions to form loose but suggestive clusters and themes offers an unusual reading experience. I found myself responding to the book as a structure, reading for its editorial notes, tables of contents, indexes, keywords, and other modes of classification and framing, the language of which is often humorous and self-critical, um, as much as for discrete chapters or standalone arguments. Gordon is right to suggest that the book can be read in many ways, 
not just chronologically or sequentially, and readers will need to understand it as another of the art projects that it documents, and hence as an artifact in its own right. In the intro, she offers us the backstory of her failed efforts to write a conventional academic book, and suggests that the form of the book documents that failure by resorting to the fragment or archival artifact as a record of attempts still in process and how it has come to its current form that, in her words, is neither quite academic nor artistic, but something in between. So I am particularly interested in why that something in between takes the form of an archive. Um, it's kind of also just an ongoing question for Avery, is the fact that she resists certain um, understandings of it as an archive. So she says it's not a library or a research collection, but instead it provides, in her words, a hospitable and comfortable environment for, and here's another list, thought, conversation, writing, painting, drawing, experimentation, invention, friendship, or political conspiracy. Uh, I also think, uh, so all those activities, um, it, it is a lot like some of the community-based queer archives that are of interest to me, but I do think it's important that it is, I think part of her resistance comes from insisting that it is not the documents themselves, it is the, what is done with the documents or it is the people and networks attached to the documents um, that provide these resources for survival for ways of living. Um, this is important, it's true that even um, counter archives including LGBTQ ones, often assume the sort of inherent liberatory power of collecting or collecting for its own sake. So that is um, an important lesson. Um, this too is where uh, it's important to remember, this is where the question of epistemology gives over to ontology, that, um, that the reason, one must never, <laughs> this is kind of note to self too, let the, qu the obsession with the archive or methodology get in the way of the question of why do we need this methodology in the first place. Um, and so uh, here I think about why and how uh, the question of writing an adequate history of slavery or the afterlife of slavery um, has entailed uh, engaging with impossible archives, absent archives, contaminated archives, and crafting a writing practice. So here Toni Morrison, um, Gail Jones, uh, Sadia Hartman, a range of people um, trying to, to uh, do something with the history of slavery is why archive and writing practice, so that, that, the, the pro that problem, um, political, epistemic, et cetera, is the one. And uh, it's interesting, Simone actually Brown, my colleague, was pointing this out. We were at the... Um, uh, uh, scenes of Subjection at 20 conference a few weeks ago that g Ghostly Matters and Scenes were published in the same year, 1997. I think it would be really interesting to think about how those books made something happen, partly because they were piecing together things that were already happening. They didn't come out of nowhere. And um, they were working with um, a, a, you know, Hazel Carby, Angela Davis, Hortense Spillers, Patricia Williams, Toni Morrison, Coney, Tony K. Bambara, Audre Lorde, et cetera. Um, so how do we keep those, you know, acknowledge those traditions, work from them, keep them moving forward. Um, and so I just want to end by saying uh, I, I want to keep thinking about why this is a kind of art practice and writing practice, but also I want to make sure that it doesn't get shunted aside or marginalized by that. I have a little bit of a worry of it being seeming like so creative. Um, I don't think we would do that with it, but, um, but uh, uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about um, how it's a record of these practices of working with people, engagement, collaboration with other thinkers and writers through friendship in a concrete practice of the social. Um, I found myself thinking about what spaces for experimental inquiry of this kind are afforded and where. So why Europe and not the US for Avery? Um, why the art world and not academia? Um, and how can we again ask for more of the spaces in which we work? Um, in, in some ways, um, this is sometimes a little bit painful to me, but also good. Avery's a runaway or a wanderer. Um, you know, that who has not been uh, well treated <laughs> by the, her discipline it always or the institutions and schools in which she has um, worked. And so I want to make sure that we use this book to 
um, make, you know, help make spaces that would um, make space for the kind of work she's doing and the kind of um, work that we want to do. So I'll just, just end with one, one more quotation that's about dreamers. Um, and uh, it, it also has a little queer dimension because it's inspired by, by Manin Fatigue, talking about um, remembering um, that there was a time when you were not a slave. If you can't remember, then invent. Um, and there's another list of castaways, runaways, strikers, idlers, organizers, wanderers, dreamers, and all those busting out of the enclosures. The list grows longer, and, it, and as it does, a certain imposition is introduced that creates contradictions, misreadings, and fragile friendships ever on the brink of breaking apart. We are almost there, but not yet. We are growing organs for the alternative and vegetables for dinner, getting dirt under our fingernails. And if you've ever had Avery cook for you, and this book also begins and ends with food and recipes, um, you will know that that too is part of the practice of um, witchcraft and running away and preparation. So thank you for the book. Thank you for many dinners. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the chance to be here. Good morning. How's everybody? Oh, a lot of people in the back. I'm glad this room is packed. That's a good thing. Um, thank you, Rod, for organizing us into this um, event. Thank you, Avery, for your persistence through many, 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 many challenges <laughs> and all those meals that I, too, have enjoyed. Lisa, I'm sure you've had Avery's cooking, too. She's a really good cook, so if she ever invites you, show up. And you don't have to help. In fact, you're not allowed to. <laughs> which is a cool thing, <laughs> just sit around and chat. All right, so um, I am a really cranky person, as many of you know, um, and my crankiness is all uh, geared toward uh, growing the love we have for each other for the abolitionist future we make in the present. And so my crankiness uh, emerges, kind of erupts, very often when I encounter what um, people purport to be uh, critical, analytical interventions, um, expressions of, for example, the black radical tradition that I, in which I can only discern a culture of complaint. I'm sick of it. Um, I uh, sit on many, many, many dissertation uh, committees and nobody in this room is guilty of this problem and if you were, you would have gotten a note from me, so don't <laughs> squirm. Um, but very often I, I find uh, in, well, in, in manuscripts that I read and dissertation proposals that I read and so forth, that people will cite, you know, the most incredibly productive uh, thinkers and writers over many centuries, uh, whoever it might be, and uh, they would only, will only cite the words in which the person has laid out the problem. You know, the U.S. is racist, Frederick Douglass. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> sick of it, sick of it. <laughs> These are things we know. <laughs> and so, in, in my view, what militant scholarship, which is what it is we should be doing, what militant scholarship should achieve is uh, an intelligence, as Avery said to us in the part that she read this morning, an intelligence, a gathered intelligence from struggles and for struggles. But even the gathered intelligence from struggles and for struggles also include, to go back to that nice homely um, image that we can all immediately uh, relate to, um, how we make and share our food. So it's not only thinking in an austere moment about the, the moment to come. And that's because, as Avery shows in all of her work and has shown in the work that we've done together in political organizing over the last 20 years, and we've known each other much longer than that, um, we know that abolition is not an absence but a presence. Um, that abolition, for example, of prisons is not a call to erase something, it's a call to make something and the making something produces the erasure rather than is um, uh, simply an emptiness 
that results from the goal of an erasure. And that might sound gradual, but in fact what the Hawthorne Archive shows is that all of liberation struggle at the utopian margins, which is where we should be all the time, is um, gradual, which is to say accumulating slowly, slowly, slowly over time. That doesn't make it pragmatic. It doesn't mean that we have to accept reformist reforms. It doesn't mean that we sh should throw some people under the bus to save others. But it does take, it is in fact, it is placemaking, which is a time using as well as time making practice. Um, I published a little piece recently in a book that Alex Lubin and Gay Johnson co-edited called Futures of Black, uh, Futures of Black Radicalism. Sorry. Sorry, guys. It's a fantastic book. And I used as an epigraph um, a line from uh, China, China Mayville's novel, Embassy Town, um, in which he writes, we were trying to find language to make sense of a time before whatever came after. And in a uh, very strong sense, Avery's book is trying to find language, which is to say vocabulary, a syntax, a layout, a mixture of the visual and the verbal um, uh, organization, uh, form, genre, in order to make sense of, a, of uh, a time, which is to say an accumulation of times, uh, however episodically we encountered them, of a time before whatever came after. And so this experiment, which, where is it now? Is it being passed around still? Okay, it weighs a ton. It weighs a ton, like I couldn't read it in bed because I don't have strong <laughs> enough <laughs> wrists. <laughs> and it's been years since I could read lying on my stomach, right? <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a book that, um, uh, I will say, because I'm a crank, it's really, really hard to encounter. Um, it's not uh, one that you open up and say, okay, after a few pages, I get it. <laughs> Avery cleverly, and I think crankily, says <laughs> in the prefatory material, if you think you already got it, you know, skip this and go on to the table of contents. Don't skip anything because you don't already have it. And going on to the table of contents, will make you pull your chin back and say, well, what is this? But then as soon as you get into the body of the book itself, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> I guarantee you just won't get it. And it will be frustrating. So then the question is, how does frustration become productive? And at least part of the answer is, if we have been engaging in political analysis, of various kinds, whether it's aesthetic or sociological or what have you, and there hasn't been, you know, a constant friction of frustration shaping what we're doing, then maybe we're not doing analysis. So this book, in its form, is demanding that we relax into the frustration so that we can figure out what it is this archive might be or might have been. And so what the book does, which is fantastically um, destabilizing as well, is it puts together something that in a certain sense never should have existed in the first place. And it puts it together in a way that makes us realize as we relax into its challenge and its refusal of authority and yet its insistence that there's got to be some kind of authority at work that's refusing its own authority, um, that this is the absent presence of past and present that can get us to the future. In short, it's a book about what couldn't have been a book, but had to be a book, because that's one of the ways that we encounter each other in the world. Um, so that, that frustration, which I'm going to emphasize because Honestly, if you pick up the book and think it's going to be an easy slide in, you will be disappointed. And being disappointed in this book is something that I don't want anybody to experience mm -hmm. at all. Um, uh, the book's uh, style is extremely lyrical, as you could tell from uh, the bit, uh, the pieces that Avery read to us, the letters. It's also, um, in her typical way, the most clear analytical um, 
as it were, social theory writing in which she explains um, and thinks about and pushes to new places uh, a number of theoretical uh, engagements with what the future might be. Uh, my colleagues have already named some of the key thinkers who turn up in this book. And so its ambitions are also destabilizing because once you get through the beginning and you think, okay, I see this is a list of items in an archive. Okay, I see there are these letters between these people. Then you get to this kind of expository uh, essay about social theory and you think, oh, I don't get it at all. And then you turn the page and there's a picture. <laughs> so you're told there's a report, which is a good thing because then you have to think about all the reports that you think that you have recognized as reports in the past to wonder, again, what a report might be. So what this then does for us is to help us, as Anne was saying toward the end, resituate our consciousness, um, refresh our consciousness as we move forward from this moment um, in the context of work, of astonishing work already accomplished and work yet to be accomplished uh, by people such as W.E.B. Du Bois. Black Reconstruction in America in my view, profoundly affected this book, profoundly, um, in its massiveness. <laughs> I think if way, this is even heavier. <laughs> well, that's because Richard used more expensive paper. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. All right. And and. Um, and you'll recall that, that toward the end, you know, in, in the propaganda of history, Du Bois says of all the people who wrote all the uh, histories of, of that period who didn't pay attention to any of the things that he paid attention to reading their work as well as having read into many of the archives. But reading their work, he found the things that they didn't say a word about. Remember how he sums up, right? They wrote so much because they saw so little. So Avery remedying that as Du Bois tried to remedy toward the goal of, of um, creating the conditions for expanded consciousness um, stops to take the time to see. And stopping to take the time to see um, brings me to a number of other writers. On the, I want to say a word about geography and probably my time will be up. So Cedric Robinson's work also, as well as Cedric Robinson, the person and the mentor, you know, profoundly affect, um, influenced Avery and in influenced this book. And in his first book, Terms of Order, he lays out in a completely different way from um, Avery's current book, but in still in a destabilizing way, a way to understand authority in order to throw it off a cliff, right? Throw it off a cliff. And I find that when people read that book, which is 30 some odd years old, today, when they get to the part where he's talking about the jokester, they don't know what to do. And they become embarrassed. They're embarrassed by the audacity of the thinker to actually not merely complain standard authority bad, standard authority bad, the United States is racist, Frederick Douglass, <laughs> but rather <laughs> to propose already something we can't quite comprehend but ought to be able to encounter and be miserable in the difficulty in, of, of in, in encountering it toward the goal of being joyful, not just trauma, joy, uh, in having encountered it. And that's where Ra Robinson makes the turn to the jokester. Avery's work, as you could tell by what she read to us this morning is, as my colleagues have also pointed out, is full of humor and, and uh, reflect, uh, self-reflection. Uh, it's full of uh, jokes that sometimes don't get to you until you've gone many pages past and you think, wait a minute, did that happen? And you flip back and find the joke. It's full, in short, of a joyful encounter with many things 
and experiences and histories that seem to be devoid of joy. But that, again, brings us back to Robinson and Robinson's insistence that the black radical tradition always centered on, right, that thing that all of us students of Robinson like to cite, the ontological totality, right, which is to say the survival of the community. And in that sense, survival is not bare, it's rich. It's not bare at all, it's rich. Other writers include um, Leinbaugh and Redeker, who, who do come up in the work, Many Headed Hydra. Again, the uh, as attempt to tell a story from the fragments of archives and to um, invent where all of the evidence might not be there. Norvez of Philip, C.L.R. James, Tony Cade, obviously. And also, the last person I want to mention here, and then I'll, I'll make my closing remarks about geography, is a filmmaker, a Portuguese filmmaker called Salifa Cesar, who I think she's based in Berlin these days. And she just um, released a film in the last year, a, a, a documentary, which she made with a collective. So I'm using her name, but it stands in for a collective, um, called Spell Real. And Spell Real is very much a filmic version, a documentary film version of the kind of thing that Avery has produced in this book. And I'm telling you all this so that you can think of all these different ways that you as individual readers and you as teachers and you as scholars can get into this book and use this book in productive ways. So what Spell Real does is it takes um, some footage that was shot by uh, filmmakers who were sent by the PAIGC, by Amakal Cabral, from the hot war in Guinea-Bissau to Cuba in 1967, as I recall, to learn filmmaking so they could come back and document the revolution. So 100 hours of footage of that uh, effort um, were discovered relatively recently in Guinea-Bissau. They had been sitting in, in canisters, a silver film, so a lot of it was destroyed, it just gone. So the archive of no archive was in those canisters. But they did manage, um, thanks to the wizardry of some uh, techie engineering guys in Berlin, to salvage about 40 hours of the footage. And it's just piecemeal, really. So you'll see Cabral, and then you get that ghostly haunting of the absence of the image where the image had been present. They salvaged it, and then she and her uh, colleagues, um, other artists, made a documentary about that footage, but also about the filmmakers who today survive taking that footage out into the countryside in Guinea-Bissau, which is where Cabral originally, as an agronomist, figured out what the needs of the people were when he was still working for the Portuguese state before he ran away from school and started with his co comrades the revolution. So he's taking that film, uh, film footage around today to show to people in communities in open air screenings so that people can talk about today in terms of yesterday and get trying to find a language to make sense of a time before whatever came after so that people can understand the now in Guinea-Bissau as coming from that before and then consider the future. Right? This book by Avery is a similarly ambitious project. It's much larger in scope. And it's got a grounding, and this is my concluding remark about geography. While all of us, me included, I like to change jobs, I like to move house and all of that, try to figure out how we can find a place where that we can make a place, the fact is that even city B, and it's you know dialectical city, anti-city, anti-anti-city, and so on and so forth, is a place in which utopian change, abolition, is always possible. Because all of geography, which is say human environment interactions on the surface of the earth, are open for the revolutionary activity that we gathered in this hot and stuffy room today to try to think about. So when we think about trapped, and Avery and I are both wanderers, 
We can think about trapped metaphorically as well as materially, and we can think about the ruptures that are possible even within the trapped conditions. So that Ori Burton, for example, has written about the radical education, self-education projects that have been ongoing in Attica from before the uprising in 71 until the present. Um, uh, other people, Jordan Camp, other people in this room, Laurel May Singh, have written about um, similar projects. So we have, to end my comments, an enormous archive, archives of feeling and archives of, let's call them provisionally, abolitionist fact, that we can use in the pursuit of these margins. But if we think as geographers, we then remember always and repeatedly that a margin is not over there. A margin is always an interface. The edge isn't the edge of the world. Here be monsters. The monster is actually on this side. So that if we consider the uh, utopian margins as at the center of where we are and what we do, how we think, how we interact, and how we read, then there is a possibility, a slight possibility, that there will be a time after. Thank you. Okay, uh, yay. Um, all right, so as you can see, this is uh, a labor of love and utopia, and in love and utopia, there's no strictness about time. Um, <laughs> um, but we have until 11.45, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, so questions, comments? I know you haven't read it, so it's hard for you. That's what Lisa's saying. Um, uh, all right, well, yeah, please. Do people hear that? Okay, in the back you got you got that? Okay. Do you want the mic? <laughs> oh, thank you. Don't break it. Um, I don't know, did you all hear the question in the back? So the, the question was about um, the framework of, or the story that I tell in the beginning of the book about the big book emerging as a failed academic book. And the, um, the point and the question was the, um, the possibility of failing to write an academic book once you have essentially achieved a level of academic success. Um, and what is involved in helping younger scholars fail first rather than after? Is, is, that, is that a good question? Um, so yeah, that's of course completely, um, completely true that I could fail um, to write this academic book after I um, have um, written some academic books that succeeded, although um, they were also not entirely normal either. This, this one's really not normal. Um, but, but the first one at the time was not very normal either in sociology. It was completely illegible and unheard of. And I think it's also important to remember in terms of the anniversaries about Bo Sidia in my book that these books when they first came out were ignored. And that's true for Sidia's book too. It took a while for those books to be found. They were passed much more from hand to hand and, and read and then passed on and they've both gotten second, third wins, but it was not true at the time. That said, um, I think that we might, everyone here might have some suggestions or, or proposals for how to fail without failing. Um, I think there's, 
that in some ways it's there isn't an easy formula for for that, um, and it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, Okay, well, <laughs> does anyone else want to say something in this area? Um, all I want to touch on that Diamond was brought up is that you know, we have to talk for the machine. Um, yeah, we have to talk for the machine. <laughs> the ghost of Mario Savio in the room. <laughs> uh, does anyone have a sabo? We can sabotage. Um, it's, it's actually, it's a little unfortunate, although completely understandable that the word failure has come up since in school, you know, failure is a grade. Um, and anybody who's in school is either getting grades or giving grades in one way or another. And that's a drag, but it's true. So maybe I if I could ma reframe a little bit, and that is create the possibilities for innovation and risk. And I think um, I know that my colleagues up here, I mean, we've all um, had the opportunity to be challenged by graduate students who refuse to fit any mold and therefore in the struggle to figure out what the project was going to be, how it was going to sound, how it was going to look and how it was going to work, did that. And so, so what does that mean? It means refusing the disciplining of disciplines, including the interdiscipline of American studies, and yet insisting, and I gotta, you know, be old fashioned and cranky, insisting that the something be a something um, at the end of the day. You know, whatever that risk is, that if one is in a line of work in which one is committed to communicating something to someone else, then you gotta do that. However you're gonna do it, you gotta do it. And without doing it, then maybe some other line of work. In the art world, in the art world, in fact, and I spent a lot of time in the, in the margins of the art world in Europe as well. So we know people in common, but we don't actually run in the same Biennale circles at all. Because I don't go to Biennales. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, I mean, there's a huge struggle now over whether artists get to fail. Because so much art, that's you know sort of forward funded by uh, foundations, by residencies, by galleries, expects some product at the end that the foundation, the residency, the gallery will recognize as something of value, which might or might not be monetizable, right? Might or might not be. So we had a big fight in Berlin a few years ago about the necessity to uh, allow artists to fail in order to figure out, you know, what art's going to be. Yeah, can I just, I, I'll just say one more thing. It's just, it wasn't just kind of like a generic failure. Like I couldn't actually just produce something. So the story about the failure is also about the way in which um, the, I didn't just really want to write the story about the racialized construction of the discourse and the history of the utopian. So it was partially about finding a form that could actually register this kind of active life world um, and these processes. And in that sense, it was originally designed as a book on these case studies and, you know, it's, it, it had a more normal format in that sense or just academic logic. And that I failed to produce. Um, and so it wasn't uh, just a kind of like just breakdown completely or something. Um, thank you. The almost um, there. How shall I put this? There are no illustrations in this book. 
Every image that you see in this book is essentially a document in the archive. So I, that is very important in the sense that they are not illustrative. The thing I did here, which is just sort of put pictures behind, was not quite how the book, the logic of the placement and the function of the images. Almost all the images have been, um, they have been in one way or another donated um, to the archive or produced by people who are associated with it. And so they have a particular, they play a particular function in it. There are some exceptions to that um, where there are other images that are more, if you like, documentary to the file. Um, but there's virtually no discussion of modernism per se. Um, visually? Well, visually, what you, what you can really trace visually, I think, is what um, research-based art practice um, has started to look like in the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years now. And so there, the, the, um, it, it does track and mark that. And there are things that are very specific about that practice that are different than a high modernist practice, certainly. Um, and one of them has to do with the involvement of artists themselves in producing words and books and texts um, and so their um, notion of an art practice that has a research component, which doesn't often look like research the way academics might do research, um, means that there's a much more horizontal relation in the collaboration. Um, in other words, it isn't just a more conventional, s conventional split between the writer who writes and the artist who makes visual work. It doesn't really work that way at all. Um, so in that sense, you can read it as a very, uh, how representative, I don't know. It certainly speaks to a certain segment of the um, certainly European art world where um, there is an elaborate para-academic, what would be called a para-academic world. So Catherine Sear, like her book would show up in Barbie Asante's exhibition in Venice this year. It's just sitting there on a shelf <laughs> with other stuff happening. Um, and so that kind of referencing and engagement is very contemporary, you could say. Um, and so you can see that. You can see that tracking of that practice and engagement at that, at that level. All right, so the question had to do with how um, the book engages uh, the question of temporality. And I don't know if we have anybody answering. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. um, I'll fill in and Lisa can say something. Um, the, what Lisa described as the future conditionality, I might describe that as the what if, um, as if. If you treat the what if as, as if, that's, I think, Lisa's sophisticated statement, that would be a simpler translation <laughs> of it. Um, but just to say, okay, so the point about the utopian margins, and to some extent the conceit and also argument of this book is that um, that seeking for, um, um, you'd say, that, that seeking for a more equitable life 
is not only in the future. That is my point. The seeking is in the past, it's in the present, and it's in the future, and those temporalities are like a palimpsest upon each other. That's the whole idea of the utopian margins. They pass and cross and coexist, just as the capacity to live in situations that are not capitalistic. All of us have relations that are not completely bound by capitalist exchange relations. So in that sense, it's in the past, it's in the present, it's in the future. It's not just something awaiting us. This is the whole c importance of the temporality to the critique of utopianism as the future nowhere, or even just the good future place that we're always awaiting. So this is jamming that machinery, that, that those temporal distinctions between past, present, and future um, in a way that parallels but is slightly at a disjuncture from the way that haunting, of course, jams the past and the present and the future too, because there you have the past is literally sitting in the room with you. It's making trouble. So this is also the past is in the room with you making trouble too, like as in a community of troublemakers. Um, but it, it's not segregated like that. So that is, I think, part of what is trying to be suggested and evoked in the items, the material that's in there, and then it as a whole. Does that make sense? Lisa, do you want to say something? Yeah, because it doesn't reach any further. I also think, I mean, Avery kept referring to the Italian theorist, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's very Gramscian, the idea that um, the na the the utopia isn't in the future, it's in the now, but we can only see it with hindsight. Um, and so in many ways, I was trying to talk about it as an apprenticeship and how to read the now, um, how to read these archives as the, r the, the radical thought and practice and radical ways of living in the now. Um, yeah, I just, there's a, um, I'm gonna see if I can find it because I don't actually have my book here. Um, that one of the people who also appears in an important way in this book is Ernst Bloch, um, who I like very much because he talks about how to see things by the star of utopian destiny. That's, that's great, right? <laughs> he just says there's a utopian reality. It has a star. You can follow it. There are red arrows. <laughs> I, I love it. It's great. But here's what he says. I'm going to find this thing if I can here. Oops. Okay, I need the book because I've written on my pieces of paper. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, shoot. Okay, I want to read this quote by him. Um, but maybe I'm not going to find it. Um, oh, here it is. Um, okay, so about this statement, Adorno said, this is the point at which speculative thought seeks a foothold. Okay, but here's what Bloch writes. He says, for more than 2,000 years, the exploitation of man by man has been abolished in utopias. In utopias, stupidi stupidity has lost its privileges. Millions of people do not allow themselves to be ruled, exploited, and disinherited for thousands of years by a handful in the upper class. Um, the vast majority do not put up with being the damned of the earth, and revolutions outnumber wars and succeed in abolishing rather than exchanging oppressors. No one is hungry. Work is not compulsory. Things are held in common and are distributed equally. There are magic tables and useful information, imagination <laughs> machines, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, right, it's, he's saying it's already been happening. For a thousand years, it's already there. We can see it. All right, we are out of time. Um, please join me in thanking <laughs> the panel for a wonderful panel. <laughs> All right, you go get your copies, okay? All right, and enjoy the conference. <laughs>